Good day, everyone, and welcome back in our journey through German idealism and romanticism. So in the last lecture, in the last recording, we went over the context to Johann Fichte, who is really the father of German idealism and German romanticism, and we were exploring the context to his philosophy of the self, his philosophy of the I am because I am, his philosophy of consciousness, of self-consciousness, and we recalled if we recall, Fichte's philosophy that he's developing takes from three strands. It's Kantian transcendental realism, it's Platonic rationalism, and it's the Hebraic Christian tradition of Logos philosophy. And so he's taking these three philosophical movements and pairing them together through Kant's synthetic a priori. And on this point, Again, it's really important to understand the role of the Hebraic theological tradition upon Fichte. Because Fichte recognizes that not only is it Plato and Kant's philosophies that he is building upon, it is the Logos philosophy that comes out of Judaism and especially Christianity as enunciated in the Gospel of St. John that Fichte is building with. And if you remember... Fichte reads the Bible as a story, an organic evolution, an organic evolution in metaphysics, right? A lot of the times people will pick up the Bible, they'll read right at the beginning, and then they'll, you know, they'll go over hundreds of pages, they'll read something in the middle, and they'll try to do that gotcha, compare and contrast, contradiction, so you can toss away the Bible, right? It has nothing important to tell us. Anybody who's knowledgeable on the tradition of scriptural hermeneutics in Judaism and Christianity would know that that is simply not the dominant form of scriptural hermeneutics. Judaism and Christianity, for the longest time, have been reading the scriptures in a philosophical and allegorical manner. Fichte is doing the same, and in his reading, he reads... Uh, in the metaphysics of the Bible, he sees the Bible as going through a process of organic progression. And it's principally concerned with this idea of logos, the logos that is within us, and this idea of consciousness, this idea of self-consciousness. Right. So if you go back to the Torah, in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the first five books are the Torah, who are the people that wrestle with God? That is to say, who are the people who wrestle with reason? It's the patriarchs, it's the prophets, it's the priests, right? It's Abraham, Isaac, it's Jacob, it's Moses, it's Aaron, right? So that's what's happening at the very beginning. So it's only a select group of people, very few, few a, a small group of people are capable of doing this wrestling with reason. But as you go through the Bible, as the Bible progresses, Fichte reaches the prophetic texts, and the prophetic texts are really important in the history of philosophy and the history of religion. This is the prophetic te texts represent what is called the prophetic revolution. This is the universalization of Logos from the patriarchs and the prophets to everybody. Fichte sees this and says, here is the moment that we see the expansion of consciousness. This is the moment that the self is born. You also get this in the Psalms, the Davidic Psalms, right? The Psalms have a lot to do with self-reflection, but this really comes home in the prophetic texts, right? Now, no longer is it just the heroes, the patriarchs, the prophets, and the priests who are capable of rational reflection, of speaking wisdom, speaking reason, in fact, it is all of us. We all have the voice of God. That is to say, we all have the voice of Logos, or the voice of reason within us. Fichte recognizes that here and says, here is the birth of self-consciousness. Now, of course, he thinks that it's implied in Plato, and he, of course, thinks it's implied in Kant, but Kant didn't do enough of that, which is why he needs to rest uh, he has to recourse back to the Hebraic Christian theological tradition in order to have some roots for
for this idea, for his new idea of self-consciousness, right? And in particular, there's, there's an important uh, story within the prophetic text. It's in the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 28. This is, uh, for people who are familiar with the Bible, this is the chapter where Jeremiah, who's one of the prophets, gets into an argument with a false prophet. The false prophet is Hananiah. Again, what is a prophet? A prophet is simply somebody who speaks, right? They speak for God. That is to say, they speak for reason. And for those who might not be as familiar with the biblical history, this is also the moment when the Babylonians are invading, right? So again, the Bible is doing more than just, you know, metaphysics or epistemology. There's a lot of stuff going on with the Bible, which makes the Bible a bit confusing uh, when, when reading it. But this is when the Babylonians are also invading. They have surrounded Jerusalem and they have hundreds of thousands of soldiers surrounding the city. And Hananiah, one of the prophets, who's a priest, basically says, everything is going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. The Bab we don't have to worry about the Babylonians. God's going to take care of everything. Jeremiah takes the opposite approach. Jeremiah basically says, look, look over the walls. Look at the Babylonian army. They're outside the gates. They're ready to invade. They're ready to conquer the city. God is not going to save us because we can use reason here. Again, reason is God. Jeremiah says that the prophet who prophesies, who prophesies peace, that is the prophet who speaks for peace, will be recognized as the one who was sent by the Lord. Right? Because peace is reasonable. Peace is what is rational. So peace is what God would want because God is reason. So Hananiah and Jeremiah are in this conflict, right? Fichte sees that and he reads into this that what's going on here is you're having a clash of reason, right? This is the formation of the dialectic. For most, most biblical scholars know that there is a tremendous dialectic. There is an undercurrent of the dialectic that runs throughout the Hebrew Bible. This is one of those moments here, okay? And eventually what happens is Jeremiah says, in the peace of Babylon, you will have your peace, right? Do not challenge the Babylonians, surrender to the Babylonians. Whatever happens, happens, but we will have peace and the Babylonians won't destroy us. Of course, nobody listens to Jeremiah and the city gets captured. But as Fichte reads the story, he sees in this story through the prophetic text, an expansion of Logos, an expansion of reason, an expansion of the self and the self-conscious, right? And then this is continuing through the Bible into the New Testament, right? Again, we get to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says it's no longer really the voice of God, which is the language that the Old Testament is using, but it's the law written in on our hearts. And then finally, we reach the Gospel of John. This is the pinnacle. This is the moment for Fichte. And he says this as he's writing his, his commentaries on the Gospel of John. This is the moment when it finally crystallized. Because what does John say? What does St. John say at the very beginning of his Gospel? In the beginning was Logos. In the beginning was reason. So reason is the first principle. Right? This is the moment for Fichte when we realize that reason is the first principle to everything. Reason is what allows us to have rational morality. Reason is what allows there to be a rational order to the cosmos and to the world. Reason is what allows us to communicate with one another. Right? Fichte famously says, that language is the expression of our thoughts by means of arbitrary and abstract signs. If you recall all the way back to the introduction lecture, we briefly talked about a figure named Johann Hamann. Hamann is influential over the rest of the German idealists and the Romantics. He's an influence on Fichte. And what Hamann said was language is reason. Language is is logos 
Okay, Fichte takes that from Haman, sees it occurring in the biblical narratives, sees it occurring in the Platonic dialogues, because what are the Platonic dialogues? It's a conversation of reason. The Socratic dialectic is a conversation of reason. Reasonable people, or supposedly reasonable people, get together and have a rational conversation, and through this rational conversation emerges truth, spoken truth. And that is what Kant is trying to reaffirm through the twin pillars of both rational introspection and experience, this idea that we can have reason being confirmed through experience and confirmed through speech. And so Fichte is playing with all of this, and it's mostly because of Kant, the idea of the synthetic a priori, upon which Fichte realizes his sort of eureka moment, right? And this comes through principally his reading of a sort of organic evolution in the metaphysics of the Bible in conjuncture with Kant's synthetic a priori and transcendental realism. Now this is where Fichte breaks with Kant. Fichte breaks with Kant over the issue of the so-called abstract concrete distinction. Kant never really uses those terms, but Fichte thinks that it is implied in Kant's philosophy, right? If we go back to Kant, if we go back to the lecture I gave on the noumenon, what is the noumenal, what is the noumenon? It is the noumenal world having a certain harmony with the phenomenological world where the synthetic and the a priori overlap. This becomes the synthetic a priori, and that is what allows us to have knowledge. But there's this area outside of the synthetic a priori, which is the noumenal world, the thing in itself, that we do not have access to. So what Fichte sees in Kant's philosophy is a movement in the right direction, but it didn't necessarily go far enough. So Fichte's playing with Kant and integrating Kant with Plato and the Hebraic tradition of Logos philosophy. And he says, Kant's philosophy of the synthetic a priori is correct, but not in the way that Kant described it. Because Kant seems to think that the concrete and the abstract are the same and they exist in the now, right? This is Kant's transcendental realism. Fichte says it's not that the concrete and the abstract are together in the present, but that history is the process of an organic movement, an organic evolution of the abstract and the concrete. Kant's synthetic a priori represents the binding together of the abstract with the concrete. That's the purpose of language. That's what the biblical stories are, are telling us in, in the evolution of metaphysics. That is what Plato is hinting at through his notion of innate ideas and the forms and the Socratic dialectic. It is the movement of the abstract becoming concrete. So immediately we see this philosophy of becoming. It is becoming reason. Okay, this is critical to Fichte. Fichte's philosophy is a philosophy of becoming reason. Becoming reason. This is the emergence of the self. This is the emergence of self-consciousness. This is the emergence of the I am because I am. Descartes was moving us in that direction, but again, Descartes, you know, step in the right direction, but Descartes didn't go far enough. He didn't fully understand the context of his philosophy, the implications of his philosophy. Same thing with Kant. Fichte, just like with Hegel, and this is going to become a running theme through all the Romantics and the Idealists, they all tend to think that they're the ones who finally figured it all out, right? That could be a flaw in their, in their philosophies if you want to look at it as a flaw, but they're all basically saying the history of philosophy is a history of organic evolution of this notion of abstract reason being made concrete. It is the self-realization of reason. It is the self-realization of reason in the world. 
That's basically Fichte's take takeaway from reading Plato, reading the Bible, and reading Kant. Kant's synthetic a priori, Kant's marriage of the abstract a priori with the concrete synthetic represents the movement of the abstract to the concrete, right? This is what allows Fichte to say that law consists in the mutual recognition of rational beings and their spheres of freedom. Its essence is that one can be enforced by reason. We recognize it through reason. Okay? And now Fichte takes this and moves it in the direction of political economy. This comes out in his book, Der Geschlossene Handelsstaat, which I'm translating that as the closed economic state. So what is going on in Der Geschlossene Handelsstaat? In Der Geschlossene Handelsstaat, Fichte is trying to understand what the implications of this philosophy of becoming reason means for political philosophy and for political economy. And what Fichte comes to understand is that in the realm of economics, we have the idea of the concrete and we have the idea of the abstract. So what is the abstract? The abstract is wealth. Abstract is prosperity. We have an innate notion, we have an innate idea of what wealth and prosperity means. And this is getting paired with the concrete. The concrete is what makes the manifestation of the abstract become real, right? It's that marriage of the synthetic and the a priori. So what are the two things, the two concrete things in the world that make this possible according to Fichte? For Fichte, it's a combination of nature and labor, right? Fichte is a laborite. This is not to say he's a socialist, although socialists will pick up on this theme of the premacy of labor. But the German romantics aren't really socialists, right? The German romantics are laborites. That is, labor is at the top of the hierarchy of economics. Labor is what is the source and the pinnacle, simultaneously the source and the pinnacle of economic prosperity. But Fichte says it's simply, it simply can't be labor because Fichte is not a monist, right? So very famously, the Gotha program, which was published in 1875 by the Gotha party, which is going to become the German Social Democratic Party, Marx famously critiques the Gotha program. It's in his essay, The Critique of the Gotha Program, Marx leans on Fichte. What did Fichte say? Fichte says that Prosperity is the result of the union of labor and nature. What did the Gotha program say? The Gotha program said it's labor is the source of all wealth and prosperity. Marx attacks that. You can see in that that the, that the German Social Democratic Party is building upon a certain element of German Romantic and German Idealist philosophy, but it misunderstands for various reasons. It misunderstood the uh, Fichtean, Hegelian, political, economic ideal. It's not simply labor, but we have to have nature. And we know that because we can just think about that rationally, Fichte tells us, right? What would happen if you had thousands of laborers and you put them in the middle of a desert, right? There's no resources in the desert, right? Let's even say there's no oil. They haven't discovered oil yet, but there's no oil in the middle of a desert, in a barren land, labor can't do anything, right? So you need to have a nature, you need to have a natural world, right? This is the synthetic, this is the concrete world. You need it to be rich in materials. But you also need to have labor, right? If you just have a land with a lot of resources but no labor, you're not going to create any prosperity. You're not going to create any wealth. So wealth and prosperity, according to Fichte, is the product of the union of labor and nature. 
but Fichte, looking at the Germanies at the time, right, because the German state hasn't emerged yet. It's, it's, the, it's the Napoleonic era. The Holy Roman Empire still exists. He published Der Geschlossene Handelstadt in 1800. The Holy Roman Empire still exists. And Germany is divided among many principalities. Many principalities and duchies. The two most powerful being Prussia in the north. Fichte's a Prussian. And Bavaria in the south. Right? So Fichte also recognizes that Germany, which is rich in resources and rich in a labor pool, is nevertheless divided politically. So Fichte's solution to this is that you have to have closed borders. You have to have a closed society. You have to take society, you have to close it off, right? You have to enforce borders because this is what's important for the well-being of labor. Fichte is experiencing at the same time an influx of migrants and refugees that are fleeing France from the French Revolutionary Wars, all the fighting that's going on in France, and it is destroying the economy. It is destroying the German economy because the German economy, not only is it divided and it's not concentrated, it can't deal with the influx of all of this so-called cheap labor, right? Cheap labor destroys the power of real labor. Anybody in, anybody in economics knows this. Fichte realizes this. So Fichte's solution, if you're going to have wealth, if you're going to have economic prosperity, you have to have a unity of labor with nature, but you also have to secure labor. You have to have some borders around uh, what's going to be extracted and, what's going, and, and what labor is going to do, right? And so you need to concentrate labor, Fichte tells us. You can't have labor dispersed because if you have labor dispersed, you have the situation in Germany that you have at the turn of the century, right? It's still an agrarian nation. It's still a pretty rural nation. Labor is so dispersed that Germany is still, for, for all intents and purposes, a backwater. We tend to think Germany as this great economic powerhouse. It wasn't that. The economic powerhouses at the time are England, right, Britain, and, you know, to a smaller extent, France. France has done a better job in modernizing than Germany has. But Fichte realizes you need to concentrate labor in order to extract resources to have wealth. But this then brings us back to this theme of the self and of consciousness, right? So la uh, labor has a form of consciousness. Long bef it, before Marx, Fichte gives us an idea of the consciousness of the proletariat. He won't use that term. Marx uses that term. Instead, it's the consciousness of labor because labor is attached to the land. Labor is attached to that which is concrete seeking to make manifest the abstract, which is wealth and economic prosperity. Labor is attempting to achieve through its own hands, right? This is the purpose of political economy. According to Fichte, the purpose of political economy is the unity of the synthetic with the a priori, right? It's that unity that Kant is speaking of in metaphysics and epistemology. It is that organic evolution of self-consciousness and self-awareness that comes out in the Bible. And Fichte is running with this, uh, running with those implications and seeking to understand what those implications are in political economy. And his conclusion is what happens is the growth of consciousness. It is the growth of economic consciousness, right? Labor is tied to land. That is what gives labor its roots. Labor is tied to land. Labor works the land. Labor becomes attached to the land. So this idea of rootedness, this idea of the concrete, is what is exhibited in laborite consciousness, according to Fichte. And because labor works the land, and because labor knows that you have to preserve nature in order to have continued prosperity, Labor grows in its consciousness, right? So the history of labor, the history of labor is a history 
of consciousness. It is a history of the expansion of consciousness. It is the expansion of wealth. And, is, and it is the expansion of economic conservationism. Fichte and the Romantics are conservationists. They're not conservationists in this modern environmentalist sense. In fact, people like Fichte and Hegel would probably say the people who are environmentalists, the environmentalists are these rich bourgeois liberals who have a lot of money and they're going to start throwing that at, in, in an attempt to save the environment because they have some attachment to it now. They think it's beautiful or something. Fichte basically would say those people are part of the problem, right? The problem of natural destruction is the lack of labor consciousness. This is the problem that the capitalists have because the capitalists do not have labor consciousness. The capitalists are not rooted in land. The capitalists are not rooted in labor. The capitalists have foregone the entire notion of the concrete and all they are seeking is the abstract, right? Again, this is all that talk about hollowness in the empirical tradition, right? It's the paradoxes of empiricism here is that even though it embraces the phenomenological, the reason why we know empiricism, according to people like Fichte, is wrong because we still intuitively have this notion of the abstract. We still have notions of innate ideas. But Fichte is not a capitalist, right? let's just get that out of the way, Fichte is an anti-capitalist, but Fichte is not a socialist in the classical sense or in the Marxist sense, he's simply a laborite. And so Fichte is reading the growth of labor consciousness as the growth of economic prosperity, but also economic uh, sort of technological advancement, right? The advancements made in economy are the product of the growth of consciousness, right? So farmers long ago would just till the land and then they realize we can't keep tilling the land the way we are because we're going to destroy the land, right? Same things happen with other industries, other laboring industries, miners, loggers, fishermen, etc. If you just completely deplete the land, if you completely deplete nature in this pursuit of the abstract, which is wealth and prosperity, you will then destroy the concrete, you will destroy rootedness, and you will destroy consciousness, right? That's what's going to happen if you simply pursue wealth without a recognition of the importance of consciousness, if you don't have an importance of the self, and if you don't have an understanding of that which is. Right? This is the mistake that the Gotha program makes. This is the mistake that Marx uh, critiques the Gotha program as having done. It rejected the idea of land. It rejected the idea of nature being the complement to labor. Right? So they go together. And so Fichte's political economy and his political thoughts are tied to this notion of the growth of consciousness the growth of self-consciousness, of self-awareness, and this movement of the abstract being made concrete, which is Fichte's understanding of what the synthetic a priori represents. So in Der Geschlossene Handelstadt, Fichte argues that the basis of the economic state is a combination of nature and labor and through that combination you have to concentrate labor. Labor cannot be dispersed. Labor has to be concentrated. At the same time labor needs to have a consciousness. It needs to have an attachment to nature. It needs to have a rootedness with the land. Otherwise you're just going to go in and completely destroy nature. right? Fichte says this is what the British are doing. This is what the British are doing all over the world. They have destroyed their own countryside because the capitalists, again, they don't have a notion of landedness, rootedness, and consciousness. They just go in, they seek wealth, they exploit the land, they exploit labor to get their wealth. 
The British have destroyed their countryside and now they're seeking to extract wealth all over the world wherever they can. And so Fichte's solution, Fichte fears that British empiricist, imperial capitalism is going to destroy not only the German countryside, it's going to destroy nature and it's going to destroy labor. So his solution is at the same time that you need to have a combination of nature and labor, labor's rootedness to the land and labor's consciousness about the need to preserve the land, Fichte also says, finally, you need to basically have a closed society. You need to have borders and this constitutes the rise of the nation. So what is the nation? We will look at that next in Fichte, but you can probably already see what Fichte is going to be building on here. The nation is attached with consciousness. A nation is attached in language. A nation is attached to land. And a nation has a defined border. And that border is primarily aimed at the protection of nature and labor. It's aimed at the preservation and the conservation of the natural land and the natural resources and it's also aimed at the protection of labor okay so Fichte has now in Der Geschlossene Handelsstadt wrestled with the implications in political economy and political philosophy as to what the rise of self-consciousness what the rise of Logos and what the synthetic a priori mean in the realm of the political. And now he's going to move from here and begin to develop his formulation of the nation. And in this, he tries to explain why the nation is rational.